Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. The military committee conference has just drawn to a close. We will have opening statements by both Admiral Bauer and General Christopherson, and after that we will be taking your questions. Admiral Bauer, can I ask you to start? Does it work? Yes. Good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the military committee conference has just concluded. Today, the NATO Chiefs of Defense, together with invitee Sweden, discussed the executability of the defense plans that were agreed by allies at the Vilnius summit. The impact of these plans is immense. Never before have NATO and national defense plans been so closely interlinked. And that means that it is crucial that we do not only firmly move forward, but that we also closely consult each other every step of the way. And that is exactly what we have done today. Today we discussed how we can make these plans work. This includes putting more troops on higher readiness, capability building and development, adaptation of NATO's command and control structures, creating and sustaining more enablement, which is logistics, host nation support, maintenance, military mobility, and replenishment and prepositioning of stocks. And, crucially, more collective defense exercises and training. To give you an example, in 2024, the Alliance will be holding its largest collective defense exercise since the Cold War, Steadfast Defender. Over 40,000 troops from across the Alliance will exercise in Germany, Poland, and the three Baltic states. A new era of collective defense is upon us. And the NATO military authorities have been preparing for this new era for years. We have never been stronger or readier. And yet, much more needs to be done in order to not only protect ourselves against current threats, but also against reconstituted threats and potential future threats. For that, we need a fundamentally different approach to public-private cooperation in the defense and security sector. Today, the Chiefs of Defense expressed their concern that across the Alliance, production capacity is lagging behind. Delivery times are moving to the right, and prices for equipment and ammunition are shooting up. Right now, we are paying more and more for exactly the same. And that means that we cannot make sure that the increased defense spending actually leads to more security. At the Vilnius summit, NATO allies approved a new defense production action plan to accelerate joint pr procurement, boost production capacity, and enhance allies' interoperability. Our liberal economies are not apt at creating the prioritization that is so desperately needed right now. This is about sustaining the foundation of security upon which our economies can flourish. Long-term stability needs to prevail over short-term profits. As we have seen in Ukraine, war is a whole-of-society event. Therefore, the prevention of war through resilience and deterrence should also be a whole-of-society event. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chiefs of Defense all expressed today their immense respect and admiration for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters in uniform. We are doing everything in our power to support them in their rightful claim for freedom and sovereignty. Every day, the Ukrainian armed forces are gaining, crown, are gaining ground on the battlefield. Every success is one step closer to victory. And even though the Russian leadership is unfortunately more than willing to let both their own population and the Ukrainian people endure senseless suffering, Ukraine will outlast and outperform them. And we will help them every step of the way. President Putin wanted NATO divided and made every attempt to do so. And yet, here we stand, more united than ever. United in our belief that the rule of law applies to all, that conflict should be solved in the courtroom, not on the battlefield, and that self-determination is an unalienable right. Ladies and gentlemen, this meeting comes at a challenging time. I want to thank General Christofferson wholeheartedly
for the outstanding way in which the Norwegian authorities have hosted this meeting. There are more than three million servicemen and women who will do whatever it takes to protect every inch of Allied territory and every single one of the one billion citizens who live on Allied soil. It is the solemn duty of the Chiefs of Defence to make sure they are able to fulfill their important tasks to the best of their abilities. We serve them as they serve our alliance. And together, we will make sure that we are ready to face any adversary in any domain, in any corner of the Euro-Atlantic area. And that brings me to my final statement. I would like to share with you the news that today the Chiefs of Defense decided to extend my mandate as chair of the NATO Military Committee for an additional six months, and to elect the Italian Chief of Defense, Admiral Dragone, as my successor for a period of two and a half years. The exact handover date will be agreed by Admiral Dragone and myself at a later date. I congratulate Admiral Dragone on being elected for this position. I'm honored and humbled by the continued trust that the Allied Chiefs of Defense have placed in me. I will do my utmost to keep unifying north, south, east, west, large and small within the Alliance, and to actively reach out to NATO's partners around the world, building on the fundamental belief that there is so much more that unites us than what divides us, and that we are truly stronger together. Christi uh, uh, General Christensen, the floor is yours. So, so thank you, thank you, Rob, and just let me add a few points. Uh, first of all, uh, I would say Admiral Bauer, let me thank you for your steady leadership, bringing the chief of defenses from all the NATO countries together and for making the military committee an important platform where we have discussed for years now, but also today, our military uh, strategy and how things are decided. I would also like, like to thank you, the press, for being here with us today. An open press plays an immensely important role in our democracy. It has actually been a great and sincere pleasure to host the NATO Military Committee Conference here in Oslo. It has been a very good conference indeed, and Admiral, Admiral Bauer just explained some of the outcomes. And I would again say we have met here in peaceful Oslo in an uncertain and unsecure time. The Ukrainian people are fighting for their homeland, for their peace, freedom, and democracy. These are values we share and hold very high. Our Ukrainian friends are also fighting a battle on all our behalf for a functioning, rules-based world order, which Russia has challenged for years. We will continue to support that fight. We will continue to support with donations with training, and we will continue to support in close cooperation with industry. I am very impressed with the Ukrainian people's will and ability to fight back. And as Admiral Bauer said, it is truly a whole of society effort in Ukraine. And it cannot be said often enough, NATO stands more united than ever. This has been evident throughout this conference as well. Putin's war on Ukraine has brought us even closer. Admiral Bauer mentioned the NATO exercise Steadfast Defender. An imp important element of that big exercise is to be, be held in the Nordic countries, and we have called it Nordic Response in 2024. The five Nordic countries have come together to host NATO allies to train and exercise in our part of the world as part of also the big Steadfast Defender exercise. This exercise will be an important milestone in a common Nordic further integration into NATO and our new plans, which we have discussed today. Once Sweden is formally accepted into the Alliance, it will fundamentally change the way we look at defense and deterrence in NATO's northern flank. Having all the Nordic countries as part of the world's strongest military alliance it's good for our region, it's good for Norway, but it's also a great strengthening of NATO and the whole alliance. 
All our defense industries in all countries will continue to play an important role in the times lay ahead, both to be able to supply our Ukrainian friends, but also to ensure that we in NATO can reach the goals discussed today. Boosting production and increasing cooperation are two key issues. We are on the right track, but we must continue to improve how we, together with industry, develop and procure military capabilities. Once again, it has been a pleasure to host the Military Committee Conference here in Oslo. NATO is the cornerstone of Norwegian security, and we are proud to be part of the strongest military alliance in the world. And again, ladies and gentlemen of the press, thank you for being here. Now we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General Admiral. Now we will be, we will be taking your questions. There is a microphone over there that will be handed around. Let me start with you, sir, and can I ask you to please uh, state your name and outlet? Thank you. Yep. Uh, yes, my name is Mikhail Hem. I uh, work for Forsvarets Forum, the national defense uh, news magazine uh, of Norway. I have a question for uh, Mr. Christofferson. Uh, when it comes to um, military equipment uh, production, uh, do you think there are certain priorities that uh, Norway could uh, contribute to that uh, we are better suited to produce than other countries. So, so the Norwegian defense industry uh, is, uh, is very good, it's, it's high quality. It produces, as we know, NASAM systems, um, air defense systems. It produces, we have production of artillery rounds. And those are two of the things that are most needed, both in Ukraine, but also uh, in NATO. So increasing the Norwegian uh, production would help the, the, the two things we are standing in, which, which, which gives us this demand for, for uh, more material equipment, to continue to support Ukraine, which we'll, we'll all do for a long time, as long as it takes. At the same time, we are rebuilding our stocks on what we are donating to Ukraine. And at the same time, we have new force requirements to strengthen NATO. So Norwegian industry plays a, an important role in that. Uh, Ma'am, here at the front, please. Uh, Alex? Oh, okay. Yeah, that works. Okay. Hi. Missy Ryan from the Washington Post. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the um, production problems and challenges that you cited, Admiral Bauer. Um, could you talk a little bit about and, and the price increases that you said would potentially eat into the impact of the budget increases? Um, could you talk a little bit about what are the factors driving the delays and the price increases? Um, is it um, are there um, material shortages, input shortages? Um, you know, what are the what are the things that you all are trying to get at in order to deal with that problem and. To what extent has the EU's efforts to um, pool defense funding um, for munitions and other defense items been able to um, uh, address this issue? Thanks. Okay, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very relevant question. And if things would have been extremely easy, there was a simple answer to your question. And, and, and that is, of course, not the case. So it's a, it's a, it's a number of things that add up to, to the problem, basically. One is that um, in the beginning, let's say since 2014, the defense budgets went up in all the nations. So at, in the alliance, the defense budgets went up seven years before the war in Ukraine. And the nation started to order. And I was a chief of defense uh, until 2021 20, uh, in, in the spring. And we already saw that delivery times went to the right and the prices went up. But to a certain extent, I can understand in the beginning that uh, uh, industries were sort of cautious because the governments in the alliance were not very well known to stick to their decisions. So basically, you could order something and then two years later it was canceled or things like that. So there was this, uh, it was almost, they, they didn't believe that it was actually going to happen, that the defense budgets were going to increase really for a longer time. But after seven years, you can no longer say that it is a surprise that the budgets went up. So that's one. Secondly, we don't have a state-controlled economy like in Russia. So uh, this is the, the outcome is a result of convincing 
private financiers, that they need to invest more in the defense industry. It is about uh, convincing those investors, and sometimes this is, this is pension funds or this is banks, and there's, there is pension funds or there are financiers that say, we're not going to invest in the defense industry because it is not ethical. And I don't understand that because this is about our own defense. So there's a lot of things to, to, to overcome. And once you have an agreement amongst investors, then they need to talk to the industry. And then there needs to be an, in, in, in a decision in the industry to, to, to build an, another production, uh, more production capacity. And then there's the local authorities that need to approve on building uh, an extra uh, factory. And then, and then, and then. So it, these things take time. Uh, and we believe it takes too much time. We're 18 months into the war. And, uh, and we, need, we, need, we need these uh, uh, this ammunition, we need these capabilities, as General Christofferson said, for two reasons. One, to continue to support Ukraine, and secondly, to improve our own readiness and, uh, in accordance with the agreements uh, that were made in Vilnius. So this is uh, a very much a conversation. So if you are a CEO in a defense company and you can tell your shareholders that the portfolio is filled until 2032, you're a good CEO. They're very happy with you. But the chiefs of defense say, that is not good enough. We need those capabilities and that ammunition earlier than 2032. And that tension is the tension between uh, what is necessary for national security, for our alliance security, and the sort of more shorter term thinking along the line of shareholder value. And I would very much like to see a discussion with the private sector on them joining the values discussion and not just the value discussion. And why is that important? Why is that in their strategic interest? Because I believe for 30 years, the industry in the Western world could basically, uh, you know, how do you say, they knew there was security. They knew there was stability. They had never had to think about whether their factory would be there next week, whether the warehouse would be there next week, like in Ukraine. It's gone because of a bomb, because of a missile. So that sort of thinking in the longer term, if it happens, in Ukraine, 40% of the economy evaporated in the first days of the war. That was private money for, 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 uh, for a large extent. That money is gone. So I think that the, the private investors have a strategic interest in joining this discussion and to actually invest in defense because there, it's not a given that, that there is stability and security in our nations. War is back in Europe. Here at the front. And then... Uh Hi, Lolita Baldor with the Associated Press. Have you seen that these increase in prices and the lag and difficulties in production have impacted countries' ability to provide weapons, particularly ammunition, to Ukraine? Are you seeing the donations start to either, um, e either lag, lessen, or stabilize at all? I'm not going into specifics because this is, of course, confidential information. First and foremost, that is a decision of the nations. NATO is not organizing this. Uh, the, the Ukraine Defense Contact Group is, a, is, a, is an initiative by the United States with the 50 nations that donate money, lethal aid, non-lethal aid. Uh, so I'm not, I, I, I'm not in a position to talk about the results of that conference because it is not a, it's not under, under NATO. Um, but it is true that nations uh, are, are, when, they, when they think about giving away weapons or ammunition, they have to think on the decision itself, am I giving away? Second, what, what is the risk that I take against my own readiness in NATO, in my own country? And, um, and, 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 and when they do, the, the, that is the result of that sort of discussion with, uh, with uh, the, the people that are involved in that decision. So. Yes, most of the nations didn't start in a warehouse that was filled. It was probably somewhere here when they started to give away weapon systems. And the volume of the weapons and the ammunition that Ukraine requires is huge. I mean, that is one of the things that we also see in, in a war like this. Again, I, I would say, it's not new per se, but the, the scale and the volume of what is used 
uh, is, is going beyond uh, our production capacity. And so we have, so, and then the only answer is you have a very full warehouse to compensate for a, for a while that you don't have that capacity. And now we see that we're giving away weapons and at the same time we are ordering new ones. And they are not in balance. So, so that's why we, the call to the industry and the governments to have a more intense uh, debate and a higher sense of urgency to solve the problem. And I don't think, I, I, so I cannot say in, 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 in response to your question that it hampers nations uh, to, to give away weapons because I'm not part of that debate in, in those nations. So that's not, it, I, it's, it's a question I cannot answer. But in, term, in the general terms, this is the sort of thing they, they will t think about. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Alf Jonsson from VG Norwegian Daily Newspaper. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, uh, artillery ammunition and missiles are in high demand uh, uh, in regards to uh, what you are talking about when it comes to, to, to boost military production. But is the, uh, is the situation so that the, the, the lack of ammunition, is that slowing Ukraine's ability to hit back to Russia for the time being? And my second question would go on the new defense plans, uh, where, not, where NATO should increase from 40,000 to about 300,000 on, on higher readiness. And that's not done in a week. So how long time, what's your estimate of the time it will take to fill up the new uh, demands in the new uh, regional defense plans? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there is not a direct correlation between the uh, too low industrial defense capacity and the progress of the counteroffensive in Ukraine. There is no correlation. Uh, the reason why it takes the time that it takes the Ukrainians to take the land they take, and we are talking about two, 300 meters every day that they move forward. Not back and forth, they move forward every day. At high cost of lives of people wounded, and the Russians, therefore, lose every day two, 300 yards. Every day. The Russians are losing in that sense. So the reason why it, it takes time is because it is extremely dangerous, because there's an enormous amount of mines in a very deep minefield, more than 10 kilometers with five, six mines per square meter. And they have to crawl forward, literally, to get through, to clear the mines, to get to the next uh, physical obstruction. And they have been successful. And yes, everybody, including the Ukrainians, would love to have go faster. But it is not possible. They are fighting a very, very difficult battle. They are moving forwards. The Russians are pushed back every day. But there is no correlation between the, 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 the defense production. It's not that they cannot move forward because they do not have enough ammunition. That is, that is not the case. Your second question is about the 40,000 and the 300,000. There is more soldiers than the 40,000 that we have under command of the Supreme Allied Commander Europe. So it's not that we only have 40,000 soldiers. We have under command of the Supreme Allied Commander by the nations, because NATO itself does normally not have troops. We get the troops from the nations. And the nations then put those troops under command of the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, which is under command of NATO. So there is more troops than the 40,000. And we went from 4,000 to 40,000 in, in a matter of days. And that was the result of all the work already done on these plans before they were approved. Because we were basically already four years working on these plans. So there was a lot of thinking already there, and there was a lot of preparations with the nations already there in terms of the military cooperation. So we were in a, in a good position, in a way, when the war started, and, and we were then able to respond very, very quickly uh, and be effective. The discussion on the 300,000 is that we need more readier soldiers. Why? Because if we are talking collective defense, you do not have the time to prepare for an attack if the attack happens. And it's not us planning that attack, it is the opponent planning that attack. 
And so if they attack, you have to be ready. And therefore, we need more soldiers at a higher readiness. And you are right. That is not a switch. That is not something that happens overnight, because you will have to uh, um, increase uh, the uh, recruitment. You will have to uh, increase the training. They will need weapons. They will need ammunition. They will need all the things that additional soldiers need. But as I said, there's more soldiers than the 40,000. So the nations that are having the armed forces, I mean, we are talking in NATO as a whole, if Finland and Sweden have joined, of about three and a half million soldiers in the alliance. So the 300,000 is the number where we talk about the number of soldiers that we foresee in, uh, at a higher readiness available for basically the first 30 days if, if it is necessary. And the, and the rest is available for if the war would, well, uh, would take longer, uh, as we see in Ukraine, we're in the 18th month, then you will need more soldiers, but you have a bit of time to prepare the rest of, of, of them. So the 300,000 is what we want the nations to be able to produce at a higher readiness. Okay, we have time to... Uh, I, would, I would just oh, like sorry. to add one thing, uh, Alpiana. It's, so the, the military leadership in Ukraine now has been fighting a war since 2014. The last 18 months, a very heavy war. Uh, they, they, they were able to fight back the first initial attack, and they continue to fight back the Russian uh, forces. So I, I have full confidence that the decisions made in how they conduct this counteroffensive is based on very sound, good leadership from, from uh, Ukrainian military uh, officers. Thank you, sir. We have time to do three more questions. So I propose uh, TV, uh, Washington Post. We start with Washington Post. And then, yeah. Uh, David Ignatius from the Washington Post. Uh, Admiral Bauer, this is the last NATO meeting that will be attended by General Milley, the American chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Could you uh, say a few words about the role that he's played um, in the NATO response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine in particular? And do you have concerns that because of current political issues in the United States, there may be a significant delay in the confirmation of his successor? Uh, let me start by saying that Mark Milley is an amazing uh, officer with an amazing career. Uh, he's a true friend. Uh, he's a great colleague to the Chiefs of Defense. And he has been an inspiration, uh, not only for us, but uh, also for the people in Ukraine. As the uh, Ukrainian Chief of Defense uh, in a meeting in January uh, said, when uh, that, that was just before uh, the war, no, that was the, the January after the, 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 the war started, uh, General Zelushny uh, paid tribute to Mark Milley as, as, because of what he has done and is doing for, for Ukraine. Um, so um, I'm sad to see Mark Milley go. All of us are sad to see Mark Milley go. Um, he is, uh, I think he's, he's not only a, a great soldier, but he's a great human being who has been under uh, tremendous stress uh, in, in unusual circumstances. During his tenure, there was a pandemic. Uh, we left Afghanistan and the war in Ukraine. So in, in four years' time, he has, uh, he has seen uh, an, an amazing sort of change uh, of what the uh, US armed forces and NATO has, has uh, gone through. Uh, when it comes to his uh, succession, uh, I mean, that's a political discussion in, in the U.S. That's not NATO. That's not a NATO question. Um, but the good thing in, in the military is that we have people that are, uh, uh, you, you know, your deputy, the deputy commander, the vice chief, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So if his successor is not confirmed, then uh, I, I understand uh, that uh, the, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will take over, and he is also an, a, a very capable officer. So, I mean, that, that, is not, that is not a question. Nobody doubts that. Um, so in that sense, uh, I don't have a, a concern there that the U.S. would respond in any different way than what we've seen 
with, uh, with Mark Milley, but as a human being, as a soldier, as a friend, uh, he will be dearly missed. And, uh, and I uh, actually gave a rather lengthy um, a farewell speech to him in the, in the, in the military committee to honor his career and, uh, and what, he, what he has done for the Alliance and for the U.S. Armed Forces. Right, so that means we have time for the two final questions. Uh, I'm going to ask you to um, bundle them together and then uh, we will hear the answer. Thank answers. you very much. It's a twofold question indeed. My name is Panagiotis Pavlos from Hellas Journal in New York. And my first part of the question to Admiral Bauer is the following. Uh, I mean, whether at this present conference, um, in the part related to the southeast wing of the alliance, have you considered any provisions about promoting Greece's role uh, as a security hub, both with regard to the east uh, borders and the internal Balkan and East European region, uh, provisions that would in a way challenge or affect the balance of power between Greece and Turkey. And the reason why I'm asking that is that because we see that Turkey holds a very firm relation with Russia, which is the object of, of, the, of the war in Ukraine, and this is indeed uh, an oxymoron. And the second part of the question is to uh, General Christofferson, uh, whether would you see as a contingent um, a war between NATO and, uh, and uh, Russia and even a nuclear war. And that, in view of the fact that it's the first time that Norway, since last year, has been sending for the first time in its history weapons abroad. This is something completely new for the Norwegian culture. Thank you. Um, we didn't uh, talk in, in, we didn't talk about very specific uh, uh, functions of the nations in in the executability discussion, because uh, the, the roles that the nations can play in the execution of the regional plans is very diverse. It, it, it ranges from the different uh, services in their armed forces that perform a role uh, in different uh, services. There can be uh, command roles even in, in the nations. Uh, I know, for example, that there is the uh, NRDC uh, uh, core in, in Greece that, that can play a role in the, in the land command uh, structure. Uh, so, uh, but we didn't talk per nation on, on all the possible uh, things that, that the different nations uh, can play in the execution, so neither uh, about, um, uh, about, uh, about Greece. In certain cases, the different nations ask uh, or, or, or report the possibilities so that the Supreme Allied Commander Europe knows what the options are and if a choice has to be made that he is aware of the different possibilities. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, your remark on, on, uh, on, on Greece and Turkey, that is a bilateral discussion. Uh, that is not a NATO uh, discussion, so uh, I'm not going to answer uh, on that. So, so no Norway and Russia has not been to war for at least 1,000 years. So we are, we are the only neighboring country that has not been in near history in war with Russia. Um, and uh, President Putin knows very well that NATO is not a threat against Russia. He says that, but he knows that, that we are not threatening Russia. Neither Norway, nor Sweden, or Finland, or Poland, we are not threatening Russia. If he believed that we were threatening Russia, he couldn't have moved all his troops to Ukraine to fight the war there. So on, a, on our border, on the Norwegian border, there is maybe 20% or less forces left than it used to be before uh, 24th of February 2022. So, so he has taken that risk because he knows that NATO is not threatening anyone. So, and, he, and President Putin is occupied in Ukraine, and President Putin started this war, and he can end it. Uh, he can pull out. Uh, Norway has since 1949 been a NATO member, and NATO has kept peace for its allies, for its members, ever since. So it's a long period of peace uh, among NATO nations, and we have enjoyed that. Um, and that's also why we need to continue to support Ukraine, because if we allow this to happen, uh, then we have changed, we have let Russia change some of the rules that has secured this peace since the end of World War II. So, so, um, so it was very early that Norway decided to move from non-lethal aid to 
uh, anti-tank weapons, to artillery pieces, to air defense. It happened in, in, a, in a few few weeks after, after the invasion on, on 24th of, of February. And we will continue. We have made a, a five-year plan approved by all parties in Parliament, which gives me the foresight I need to plan for both donations, training, working with industry, but also buying back uh, or buying new equipment to, to the Norwegian army to fill up the gaps uh, based on what we are, well, we are doing with Ukraine. So, so priority one now, support Ukraine for as long as it takes. If I can build on the answer of uh, General Christopherson, as he says, Russia knows NATO is not a threat because we're not intending to attack them. Otherwise, they would have responded completely different to the accession of Finland, and they haven't. They talk about it, but they haven't in physical terms. The reason why Russia attacked, and the same applies for Ukraine. The Ukraine wasn't a threat for, for Russia as well. The reason why they have attacked Ukraine were democracy, freedom, rule of law, and the, and the fact that uh, Ukraine more and more was wanting and willing and, and, and showing they were making their own decisions about their own future. And that was a danger, that is a danger, if that democracy settles more and more and becomes, uh, you know, in the heart of, of the Ukrainian thinking, as we see, as we see, then uh, that is a danger to the Putin regime, because then people in Russia might start to think the same. Thank you both. We have time for one, one very quick final question, and then we really have to wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, are you any closer uh, to solving the puzzle of the Nordic countries' uh, place in the joint force commands? Brunson versus uh, uh, Norfolk and such? It's not a puzzle, actually. I think yeah. uh, we agree on the fact that the Nordic nations uh, uh, rightfully sort of belong under command of the Joint Forces Command Norfolk. There's one practical issue, and that is that the, the present, the, the setup of the command as it is, is too light. Uh, we, we, we know what it should be, and, and it, it needs an increase of about 400 people, to give you an idea. We, it needs about 400 people more to be able to conduct the tasks that come with those responsibilities. So it is now up to the nations, and not only the Nordic nations, but it is up to the allies, to the allied nations, to help to fill the Joint Forces Command Norfolk with the right people in the right numbers. And once that is the case, and they need infrastructure, and they need computers, and they need communication, and they need everything you need to run a, a, a command. And once that is in place, then you can shift those nations under his command. Not earlier, because otherwise he's unable to perform and to, to be responsible for the task. So it's not a puzzle. It is a practical puzzle in the, sin, in the sense that we... Uh, uh, so I think there is an agreement. The nations in the Nordic... The Nordic nations are happy with this construct, uh, construct but it will take a bit of time. Uh, yes, we, we, we have, I'm very happy with Finland being a NATO member and Sweden soon becoming one. And also happy that we all agree that we should be under the same command. And Supreme Allied Commander Europe, Chris Cavoli, you know, the, the, the Supreme Commander, he, he supports that. So he's the one who gives the final advice on, on the command and control structure. So, um, so we will find the, the good arrangements uh, and we will continue to man up uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I said to the press earlier, I, I want it done by 2025. So uh, that's what we are aiming for. But then there is a lot of practicalities, as, uh, as Rob said. Uh, but then you have aligned, you know, it's, so the regional plans is about plans. It's about force structure requirements, what forces belongs to the different plans. And then in the end, it's about command and control. So I, I think the force structure is more important now because command and control is basically a line uh, on a map. Uh, you can cross that line. It's not a wall. Uh, so Norway will still contribute with forces also in other joint forces commands, like, for instance, in Lithuania. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, General. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Have a wonderful evening in Oslo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good questions.